So what's resilience? Well, I know we still get stuck on this idea that you know you can't stop the waves. You, you know this individualizing idea. John Kabat-Zinn, of course, is the uh, the fellow who's been taking Buddhist monks and putting them in the FRM. FMRI machines and sort of scanning their brains and demonstrating neuroplasticity. Good work. And he'll say things. I heard him recently say, you know, you can't stop the ways that you can learn to serve. He's kind, of, he's kind of right, but he's also kind of forgetting that it's a lot easier to learn to surf if you also have a surfboard, a coach, and a lifeguard. So I know we all sort of want to look like this, right? This kind of calmness in our lives. Or maybe we want to be a Buddhist monk in a monastery high up in the mountains or something like that. But what we forget is that Buddhist monk isn't sitting there doing his thing. He's embedded, he's not alone, he's embedded in a community. And there are people beyond the monastery who are having children, raising crops, you know, harvesting those crops and producing the food that feeds him so that he can be, in a sense, a spiritual guide to his community. I think we sort of misunderstood that, you know, before you go to, you know, buy your Lululemon yoga mat or whatever you're going to do and race down to the yoga studio, I would say to people, make sure your spouse is going to look after the kids after school first. So that there's some balance in terms of that your resilience is tied up in the resilience of the systems around you. So what's resilience? If it's not just this individual set of qualities, then I'm going to suggest it's in the, when there's exposure to significant adversity, because that's kind of what we talk about when we think about resilience, not, we're not talking just about positive psychology here. Um, resilience is our capacity to navigate to all the psychological, social, cultural, even physical resources that sustain our well being, and our capacity to negotiate for these resources to be given to us in culturally meaningful ways. And I know that's a lot of words, and you know, just saying, you know, bouncing back is easier. But it's not just that. It's really about our ability to find the resources that we need, the things that we actually need to give us help. It's like being, you know, imagine just being lost in the forest without a compass or a destination or a cabin to get to. It's not just about, you know, the desire to go somewhere. It's also about whether or not we give, you know, the resources are there for us, as well as our ability to negotiate or, get, you know, to get what we need in ways that are meaningful. And I'm going to argue that in Botswana, or indeed in the other examples here that I've been giving in Northwest Collegiate in Baltimore, what's amazing is that the programs work, these interventions work because they, they in a sense give young people and the families what they need in ways that make sense to them. What I'm actually getting at here is of course, I'm talking about a systemic or a multi-systemic understanding of resilience. We know that your microbiome, your gut bacteria affects your, your immune system, which affects your moods, your propensity or your susceptibility to anxiety and depression and these kinds of things. And we know that the external factors or whether or not there's a natural environment, whether you, you exercise more, if there's sidewalks to walk on um, and parklands to go into and everything else. In fact, there was a, a little experiment in Britain recently, I, I, some, some colleagues of mine in the public health field, they tried to get seniors to exercise more. So they did a needs assessment and the senior said, yes, if you give us a park, we would do that. So they, they actually got a parkland designated across from a large senior center. And for like a few weeks, the seniors used it, and then they all stopped using it. They went back to the community. I said, why did you stop using it? And the senior said, well, the light to cross the road is too short. It's really scary. We don't have enough time with our walkers, as you will, to get to the park, to get across the road. So they had to go back to the, the town planning in London, England, and actually get them to change the length of the light in front of the seniors. And then the seniors used the park. It's, it's remarkable when we begin to think more systemically about what we can get. Here's a good example, though, of, of, of this kind of idea of adapting environments to bring out our best selves, which is um, if we want to get kids to move more, a colleague, Dean Krillars, at the, uh, um, uh, does stuff on physical literacy. What he did was he did a whole bunch of tests on kids in elementary school where they put uh, accelerometers on the hips of the kids for a whole week to see how much they moved and how fast they moved. And then on the weekend, he went in and painted hopscotches on the floor. And magic. The next week, they did the second data dump, you know, whatever. And they, they found, of course, that the kids will move more and they move faster because what kid or adult can prevent, you know, can miss that opportunity to, if you're going down a hallway and you see a, a hopscotch, you're going to hopscotch, right? You're going to get involved in that activity. And this is this kind of notion then that what we need to do is, if I might, help people, I'm just going to go back to this, we need to help people raise the resources so that they'll choose more socially desirable ways of coping. 